Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 7. And on today's show, we're going to be looking at the films that are coming out for March. We're going to have our tick on uh, a few of the films that are coming out. And then moving on from that, we actually had the, the pleasure of going and watching The Invisible Man. So we're going to be doing a bit of a review on that. Um, so yeah, other than that, let's get into it, guys. So now, let's move on to March and the films that are coming out in March. Um, so we're actually going to talk about four specific ones. So we're going to talk about A Quiet Place, Part 2. We're also going to talk about The Hunt. Um, we're also going to be talking about Bloodshot. And Disney's very own live-action version of Mulan. So guys, let's kick it off. A Quiet Place 2, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, really like the first one. Uh, and I don't hate the idea of a sequel. I like the fact that um, John Krasinski, the director, came back mm. and decided to do it. The trailer looks really dull and nothing It's too like they're exciting. trying to hide a lot of it. Y yeah. Yeah, I, I, I get the same thing. I just can't get excited about it for some reason. I, I, I don't know why. It's it, The first film was great, but it just felt like it didn't need a sequel. Um, and so I'm not sure how to feel about it. It might be great. It might be great. Yeah, it's just like by adding in what's clearly like flashbacks to get him in it, it's like you don't need to be in it. You don't need to have those points of how did it start. It was kind of more interesting that you didn't know how it started. It just happened. Mm -hmm. But I guess, you know, it made a lot of money and people probably kept asking that question in the studios. were like, you should explain how it started. And they were yeah. like, all right, all right, we'll put that in the beginning. Do you not find, though, with like horrors very much like this, um, why they do so well in their original one, or the first one, is because you are always on the edge of your seat because you don't know what it is that's chasing them. And then eventually it gets revealed at the end and then they overcome it somehow. Uh, but with this one, like you can clearly see within the trailer that there's lots of images of the creatures, which... Well, I don't know about you guys, but it just doesn't feel as tense. Well, it, it kind of goes back into like the classic uh, thing with, if you remember Alien, yeah. Ridley Scott's Alien. One Alien. It's a horror movie. Second film, Aliens, is an action horror film, and there's multiple aliens. And people always say that when, whenever you go to a sequel, you kind of people always go, are they going to do the Aliens thing? Of just more monsters. Yeah. Because it goes more into action horror and it looks more like an action horror film. Yeah, it does lots to me, of... yeah. With that, with that stunt driving scene at the beginning and stuff. Yeah. Like that, yeah. Which again, is it can nest, they might be like some really great like setups and stuff and it might work. It's just what made the first one so interesting is the way they use sound and the way they had to slowly creep things in and it was, it was so effective. Mm. And with them going more towards whispering like this when they're talking and stuff. It just goes, well, now they're just communicating too much. Mm. They barely communicated at all in the first film, and it was great. Yeah. But, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not sure about it. I, it's probably going to make lots of money, and we'll probably see a third part, and it'll, they'll just keep going with them. Yeah, yeah. It's become an anthology. But, yeah, I just don't know whether... We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. Like, for me, I think from the success of the first one, there's not really anywhere else they could have gone. If they did exactly what they did in the first one for the second, then you almost kind of shoot yourself in the foot. So it's it's only progression, if you want to call it progression. It's the only way that they could have moved forward. Potentially. Yeah, I mean, which is why I think that it didn't need a sequel. Exactly. <laughs> I think that's the problem with a lot of like industry these days, is that whenever there is a film that is successful, it's very much like, hey, what can we do to make... Like Joker, for example... It was very successful. It cost fifty million dollars, um, and they're already talking about the potential of a sequel because of how successful it was. Whereas actually, if you just left that alone, then it's absolutely brilliant. Inception is another one that because it was left alone, and it's it just its thing, yeah. yeah, the Prestige, another I suppose pretty much Nolan films, yeah, other than Batman. <laughs> That's the thing, and I know that like he, the director, came up with you know it was him that decided to do it because they wanted to do a sequel immediately, and he was like, All right, I'll produce it. I don't want to write it and direct it. And then he was like, Actually, I want to continue these characters. And I always like to believe that's true, and it's not just a cynical way of saying they gave me lots of money. Yeah, yeah. And I just started writing. <laughs> yeah. it just... 
Yeah, but you know, it's always going to be a bit of both, isn't it? You got yeah. you got to admit you're you're always more inclined to work on something when when someone's giving you money for a it. Paycheck. <laughs> exactly. I think I mentioned it last week, but um, there's also been like this influx of like nearly every week there's been a new horror film. And although this is more like blockbuster horror kind of thing, it probably won't be affected by so many horrors happening. But it's kind of like, I don't know, it's just not one of the more exciting ones. The more exciting one for me, and it might not even be a horror because no one really knows completely what it's about, is The Hunt. Yeah. yeah. Now, and most people probably remember with The Hunt, it was supposed to come out on September 27th. But when Trump found out what it was potentially about, it got banned. And uh, the hunt is the hunt is actually based on um, the story the most dangerous man, which is a like, classic story of rich people hunting poor people. There's been loads of different film versions of it throughout time, but they didn't kind of reveal that until like later on. So when the first trailers came out, it just sort of showed Trump supporters or deplorables being hunted by the elite. <laughs> Played by mostly comedy actors. Like most of the cast are good comedy actors. You got Dennis from Sunny and Philly and I mean it's ridiculous that they, they wanted to get it shut down for that reason because I mean I, if if they showed a film of the of the elite hunting down the working class in, in Britain, I would be like, Yeah, that's exactly right. That's that's, that's <laughs> how it that's how it happened. But no, um how how do these Trump supporters want something shut down that is Actually, yeah, kind of, yeah, def in defence of them to some respect. I mean, I don't think the film actually is from seeing this new trailer. But No, it seems more that it's playing on satirical edge. It's a bit of dark comedy that got, mm. you know, old people like Trump freaked out and were just like, oh my God, this <laughs> Get is... Get it off our screens. You're yeah. not showing this. It, it doesn't help that, of course, around the same time there was a lot of, you know, gun killing sprees. Yeah. A lot of shootings and it made people just want to go, no, we want to step away from that. And I didn't think it was going to come out this quick. I thought it was going to be dumped on a VOD site. I did not expect it to actually come out. And um, Jason Bloom, the producer, because like, obviously Bloomhouse is behind it. And uh, yeah, he basically said that he thinks, and he was, he's probably wrong, it's probably not going to make as much money as he thinks it's going to do. But he thinks it could hit, hit the get out sort of zeitgeist. Oh, really? Because of the, like, the film is more intelligent than you think it is. It's not just so violent and just focused on that. There's mm -hmm. a lot going on here. Like but undertones. That, that new trailer seemed to be very much a wink to the audience about yeah, yeah. the fact that it got banned. And i I got to say, I was wondering when I was watching that trailer, have they added these bits in just to make this, a, you know, this point kind of thing? A big um, F you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, or is it... You know, it was it already there, and they've just taken advantage of the fact that it was there. I mean, like. that's it. It will be interesting to see if they've had to recut any of the film, or if any elements have had to be little tempered with or tampered with. Because um, the director uh, Craig Zobel, Craig Zobel did a film called Compliance, which came out a couple of years ago, and that's a really horrible film. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant, but it's so nasty where it puts you as the audience. And he's very good at doing that kind of thing. And that's why it's kind of called cool CL. He's got a bit more of a platform with like bigger actors. What's he going to do with the hunt? And then it disappeared quickly. So yeah, it's cool to see it back. And I didn't, I didn't think it was going to get an immediate like worldwide release yeah. that quickly. I thought we'd have to wait a good couple more months whilst the Americans got to watch it. But no. Nah. For me, <clears throat> just looking at the trailer, I think it looks very much like a modern version uh, to, besides the sort of dark comedy element to it but like a modern version or modern day um hunger games where they've been selected they're put into an arena or an well, area i think the hunger games is probably based on the most dangerous man as well it's probably, probably. Like, there's probably some like similarities yeah yeah and i feel like that story can always play well because like jack said earlier the, the rich are always screwing the poor so yeah. you can always create that those kind of imagery. Yeah, and it's just attaching different labels to those things at times. Yeah, yeah. It? yeah. And the fact is, it's just more, much more interesting, and at least it's trying to be doing something, and like compare that with uh, Bloodshot. I was going to say, and <laughs> on the topic of interesting, <laughs> or not so interesting. Lack thereof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we should probably admit that we don't read Valiant comics, 
We don't know anything about the Bloodshot character. No. So it can't really. We looked at a picture of the guy. Yeah, I, I recognise him from something. He when might I was have a cartoon, maybe like yeah. an, an ad in a, another comic book or something. That's. <laughs> but um. But yeah, yeah so, I, I, I gotta say the yeah. film. It, it looked like it, we said it was uh, you know something from. It seemed like something from the uh, early noughties, yeah. essentially. Like it just had that feel to it where it was like nothingy and. Yeah, turbo boosted kind of computer game sort of graphics with Vin Diesel, mm -hmm. and you just like you can't do anything beyond Fast and Furious, can you? <laughs> yeah, and anything so outside stuck. of that, he's just he's never really kind of taken off, has he? Chronicles yeah. of Riddick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, like him and Guy Pearce, another great. Well, Vin Diesel's not a great actor, but Guy Pearce is a great actor, or at least he was in the nineties, and then with Memento in two thousands. Yeah. And he just keeps popping up in these really bad action films where he's clearly cashing those paychecks, playing the villain here and there. Yeah, well, you, that's the, the first thing I said was, oh, Guy Pearce, he's the villain. And then as the trailer plays out, you start to, like... One thing I do get frustrated about with um, <clears throat> sometimes, like, uh, the way that trailers are conducted and made and created is that they give too much of the story away, yeah. but they also edit it in such a way where it's all chronological everything that they show you with flashes of bits that are sporadic. It's funny you say that, actually. Cause they... That's very much... Sorry, that's very much, like, chronological, isn't mm -hmm. it? They kind of give you the early premise and then you can kind of see what happens and where it's going to go. Mm. Go on, sorry. I was just going to say, uh, Jason Bloom, the guy from the producer of The Hunter... Uh, the Hunter... The Hunt. He basically had said that recently, like, going back to The Invisible Man, that something like the trailer showed everything and they kept certain things and the director was like, please keep these away. And apparently the main reason that Jason Bloom says they do this for trailers is because of streaming. People are used to being able to go to wherever they want in a story or... I don't really get the mentality of what he's talking about, but like I, I understand that if studios are thinking that streaming audience need to see everything that's coming up in a trailer, and that's why you get so much less, you know, it's just... Here's your plot, here's your plot, here's a few set pieces, this is everything. I think that that works to a, a certain degree if the film was coming out on VOD straight away. Yeah. But if it's going into cinema, like, I think it's Keeps a completely him. different kettle of fish, isn't it? I'm yeah, sorry, he, he thinks that people just flick through films at random. I don't know, it's something to do, I don't think it's necessarily I mean, that. If, but it's... if anyone's using a streaming site like that, just stop. Yeah. Just, just stop watching films <laughs> altogether. Uh, no, <laughs> sorry, that, that's no, that's, no, no, no. that's crazy. I bought yeah, Netflix that's, just that's, to flick through. I, you know, uh, like it's insanity. I just know that the, that the audience who stream in their minds, they need to be seeing the whole, everything like directly through. I think I know what you're saying. Is it because we live in an age now where everything is so accessible in terms of oh, we've got video on demand. How many video on demand sites are there? You know, you got Disney Plus coming to the UK um, yeah. on the 24th of March. Um, and, <laughs> um, yeah, so you've got like all these other different things. So I think that's probably why, you know, trailers are then set yeah. up in this certain way that this is what's going to happen and then this is going to happen and this is going to, but we're not going to show you the end. So go to the cinema and watch it. This is it. I learned nothing from that trailer. In fact, that trailer weirdly reminds me of like really bad versions of Blade. See, I've I learned a lot. I see. I don't remember much apart from the fact that there were some comedy characters, like again those early two thousand films where they're like hanging out with the really strong, powerful, valiant or or magical guy. I don't know. I don't know what it was. Well, think <laughs> if you if you break down the trailer, right? They were very clever in the terminology and the words that they used to show. Okay, so the first thing is Guy Pearce turns around and goes, "What do you remember? Like you died. What do you remember?" And then oh, yeah, you have all these flashes stuff. of his memory before he died. And then they, they kind of almost inadvertently, I did a quota thing. That's a quota. quota. Is that quotation. Quota? Quotation. quotation. I did quotation. Did yeah. a quota. I did a quota. Um, so yeah, quotation fingers. Um, yeah, they send him, well, they, uh, they don't send him out. He gets free and goes off and it looks like he, he thinks that he's killed the people that like killed his wife. Um, and then they shut him down. And then they reboot him, and you see that one shot where it's the person in the same clothes, but the face keeps changing. And like it, Guy Pierce at one stage says, "Line up the next target." So it's it's very much that they've 
kind of gone so boring you yeah, sound like you could describe a computer game to well me. yeah they, they've basically like they've game. basically created an, uh, an ultra soldier um <clears throat> who is an assassin oh, oh we God. want this guy to be killed go get him it's just yeah like but they reprogram time, every time they shut story. him down yeah i mean uh, that's what it looked like to me and that's what I mean about the simplicity of the, yeah. the trailer. It's, it's fair, other than the, the shots that they choose to like, fill in The thing in is, with you it. can tell Vin Diesel, there's part of him that thinks this could be my next break. It's yeah. like, no, oh, Well, no. with everything going on with Fast and Furious. Well, that's going to be the fallouts and Well, no, they'll keep making those until oh, they will. space. <laughs> It'd be like Fast and Furious 49. <laughs> but, just going to simmer for him. <laughs> It's just yeah. It's just it just looks mindless and pointless and uh, kind of desperate. A bit like um, a bit like Mulan. Mulan. Mulan has a similar kind of feel in the sense that any time Disney tries to be remotely progressive, there is like some strides towards yes, that's good. You're you're hiring more people of diversity behind talent and in front of talent. You should have done that years ago. Yeah. But at the same time, it's always got to be filtered through a Disney platform. And Mulan looks kind of, kind of weird because it looks deadly serious. And, I, and, and this, is, this isn't based on, like, this is a more direct based on the true myths of Chinese folklore. This is supposed to be still a live action remake of the cartoon. And if anyone remembers the 90s cartoon, there was yeah. a little dragon voice by Eddie Murphy. Oh, yeah. And, and, and there were musical numbers. I don't remember the dragon. There was a little dragon voice by Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Shit, my memory's not as good as I thought it was. So yeah, like, <laughs> I, can, I can remember that film. I can remember that. You don't character. remember yesterday. I can't remember the, the, the dragon. Yeah, so it's a little tiny red dragon. I think I swear he had like a little yellow belly. Yeah, it was basically what they tried to do. Well, I think I remember. I think I remember like a toy of that. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. No, I remember that now. I remember that now. Well, it was kind of like because I think if I remember correctly, either this came out before or after Hercules. I think Hercules was. I think it was before Hercules. I'm not sure. Because Hercules had a similar structure where you'd have, have a Google a little demony character who's his sidekick, and they help him on the journey, and they did that for a lot of histor historical things in the nineties, for Disney cartoons. They just kind of went. All right, here's your little side character. We're going to mix in some truths and just throw some musical numbers in, and here we go. And they did that all the time. Now, with the new Mulan, they decided to go, no, no more musical numbers. We're going to tell proper Chinese folklore, directed by um, the director of uh, Whale Rider, which is a really nice film. It came out years ago. Mm. But there's just some things like it costs 200 million, yeah. which is a lot. And it's a PG-13, which for us means it'd be like a 12. Now, all these yeah. remakes don't tend to go more towards a teenage market for something that, again, I remember with a li about being, there was a little dragon, not the big epic violent war that was going on. <laughs> I don't really pay attention to that bit. That wasn't what I was focusing on. It's like, what audience are they going for? They're trying to get the Chinese market, of course. And of course, there's even bigger issues of the controversy with all that. But it just seems, yeah, that there's... Nothing. I sort of forgot it was coming out, and then when I was looking at what's coming out this month, I was like, "Oh, Mulan's out! Oh yeah, I forgot about that." It just yeah. Hercules was before Mulan. Yes, yeah, ninety seven. I thought so because they, they they it has a very similar structure. Um, Mulan does like in the way that they've got like the mythical character that's a side character to help him along the way, and and yeah, like I don't know. It just it just doesn't look very good to Mulan. So, to me, I think. The trailer is actually pretty decent, and to explore a live action, uh, like you said, Chinese, um, what was the word you used? Folklore. Yeah, Chinese folklore. Um, to delve into that, regardless if it's Disney or not, I think that would be really interesting. And okay, we've seen this story before because we've got the animated Well, that film, is the other thing. There are actually loads of Chinese films about the Mulan story. It's not just, this is just Disney's version. Yeah. And they're spending all this money to try and be like, this is the ultimate story of Mulan and stuff. And it's like, to me, it would, if I was Chinese, I'd be like, this is a bit of disregard to the ones that we already have there. This is just you jumping on to try and hit our market. You feel like it's jumping on the bandwagon? Yeah, it's just, it's to, it's to make money. And it's, it's because Chinese market was, I say was because of the coronavirus, it was the most booming movie market it's in the world. two weeks in a row. 
you know? Mentioned that. Well, I had to mention the coronavirus. Yeah, yeah. Then it is, it we, is. We don't even things. know if, if Mulan will actually come out. Yeah. Because it's yeah. supposed to come out at the end of the month in China, big world premiere, big, like, that's got to be the focus. And there's that ethical question of whether it should be released or whether we should just wait until, you know, the world's in a bit more of a safer place before having these sort of screenings. Yeah. And that's not even the only controversy with Mulan. You've got the fact the actress, Liu Yifei, she was a uh, pro Hong Kong uh, police during this. At the moment, there's there's a big old struggle between the protesters and the Hong Kong government and the police. And she was pro the police, so there was a boycott. Mo- uh, yeah, the Mulan. police have been proper brutal to the to the protesters out there. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's it's nasty. It's really nasty. <laughs> and there have been a few other actors, such as Jackie Chan, has been pro police, and a lot of like highly respected Chinese actors. And Again, it's just caused a lot of controversy for something that was supposed to probably be a hell of a lot cheaper for one. I can imagine the ambition was not to spend 200 million on... Because I don't remember my, uh, completely, but Mulan didn't feel like it was the high tier of animated Disney remakes. And... It wasn't. I think it came out around about a time where I could be wrong, but it looked like they were scraping at different kind of animated ideas. If you think back to the original like lock of Disney films that came out. A lot of them were original or, you know, played off fairy tales and stuff like that. Yeah, if you think when the boom sort of started with like Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin and all those kind of films, then by the end of the 90s, you're getting towards your Mulan and well, yeah, it, whatever uh, stuff. I can't was remember. Was it 94 that The Lion King came out? I think yeah, it was yeah. 94. And that's the thing, when, when looking at the box office with that sort of stuff, if you think about like the recent boom, for every Lion King that makes 1.4 billion something or other pounds, whatever, you get Dumbo, which makes nothing. Yeah. They're, but they're they can s- afford to do it yeah. to make Dumbo because they're so successful off the likes of the Lion King. And that's it. It's just like, I feel like Mulan's going to be another one of those cases. Or I'm wrong and China buys loads of it, but then if the cinemas are closed, how are you going to... Yeah. But going back to the four films uh, of the month instead of the impending coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the doom, the doom. Business goes on as usual for us. I, I guess we'll <laughs> have to fight on. We'll, we'll try and go and see these films this month, or at least one or two of them. Yeah. Probably The Hunt. Yeah. And maybe A Quiet Place too. Yeah, yeah. I'd definitely be up for it. So, Not Mulan. <laughs> I'll go, but I'll, I'll go on my own and watch that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Me and a kid's. <laughs> <What on earth? laughs> oh God! And on that note, <laughs> shall we move on? Nah. So, guys, we had the opportunity to actually go and watch The Invisible Man, and um. Shit. So now, guys, we're going to go on to the um, the review of The Invisible Man. We have managed to sort the cats out. They are fine. Um, they got into a bit of a scrap. Anyone who wants to know. They got into a bit of a scrap. There's this big cat. This big, black, vicious cat. A beast. Yeah, yeah. That lives in our area and um, likes to pick on our youngest cat. And um, our older cat, she just takes no shit. Um, but she was off, so the younger cat just got bullied, and um, yeah, but he's fine. He's good as gold, and he's here now. <laughs> You're right, Gray. Uh, anyway, <laughs> now that the cat fiasco is kind of... <laughs> we, uh, we went and saw The Invisible Man. I was coming to that. <laughs> I think you actually already said it. <laughs> I did say that. <laughs> So anyway, we, we went and saw The Invisible Man. I'll, no, say, it now. I'll, I'll say it now. It was great. It was, Does anyone it was, else want to say this? It was, it was, no, it was, a, it was a real... It was. I really enjoyed it. I think sometimes the, the dialogue was a bit clunky, but other than that, I, I thought the rest of the film was uh, really, really cool. Uh, like, it... It played on so many sort of uh, metaphorical ideas. I don't know if you spotted... Um, I'm going to go straight into like the deep end detail now. Spoilers. <laughs> I spotted, I spotted Spoilers. you breathing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, the, the first, the first thing that the invisible man does, do you remember what that, do you remember what that is? He, he, he turns up the gas on the, on the frying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
right? Um, and to me, I just thought that's gaslighting. They're, they're doing a little, they're doing a little sort of like nod to the idea of gaslighting, which is you know a form of psychological abuse that happens. So there was a loads of clever little like metaphors in there. I didn't clock that. No, no. I, I, the other thing about it was that the frying pan was on fire afterwards, and it sort of made me think like out of the frying pan into the fire kind of thing. Ah. So there was a there was a whole sort of like level of metaphor that you. And knowing that the character who's created this invisible suit is uh, is a genius, you you kind of think like is he he must be doing this deliberately. He must be aware of what he's doing. It had like loads of that psychological. Yeah, yeah. Where is it like the because um, the Invisible Man like this is Universal's opportunity to try and rebrand the Invisible Man. Mm. It's an old franchise from nineteen forties. And usually it's from, um, you know, so from the male perspective, it's from the man slowly turning invisible from some sort of potion, or there was um, the 2000 version with Hollow Man, mm. Kevin Bacon. And um, yeah, because Bloomhouse have basically gone, look, let's help you out with these monster movies, because Universal, like, keep fucking it up. If we remember The Mummy with <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Tom Cruise. I actually which, did like that film. But it might as well be called Tom Cruise featuring a mummy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? it's only, I only liked it because it's Tom Cruise. I like Tom Cruise. But they were trying to build this whole entire like universe because they, I, I, they had Jekyll and Hyde, um, Russell Crowe playing him. And they thought it was going to launch it and then they, then they cast them, Javier Bardem as Frankenstein, Angelina Jolie as Bride of Frankenstein, Johnny Depp as the Invisible Man. And no one wanted to watch The Mummy. It made no money. It cost a lot of money. So Bloomhouse went, all right, maybe maybe we could do something different. Let's go back to making them what they should be, horror movies, not action. But on low budgets as well. Yeah, on, on really small budgets. But that's Bloomhouse's thing. That's mm. what they've done with um, Insidious and Paranormal Activity and stuff like that. And the director of The Invisible Man was, um, I'm not going to be able to pronounce his name right, he's an Australian dude, Lee, Lee Winhell. Uh, he co-wrote... Uh, saw with James Wan and Insidious oh, really? with, with James Wan yeah. so the guy's got a love Insidious for horror and yeah, yeah. And he, and he, he directed um, Upgrade which is a great film as well and he apparently mm. pitched the idea of the Invisible Man to him so they wanted to obviously rebrand the whole entire thing at a much lower cost and they succeeded to be fair it's I just think, a much more interesting take on it yeah and to go back to that element I would like okay it's a horror film don't get me wrong but it's not the kind of stereotypical jump scare horror film where you're on the edge of your seat, you're like, oh my God, there's like a serial killer or anything like that. It's more psychological than... I think there was one or two jump scares there's in there. D- there's but... definitely jump scares, so it's still a horror, yeah, yeah. But, but it's, but, I mean, it's that's psychological. Not, that's not what the, you know, but it's horror playing... isn't defined by, uh, no, no, by no, no, jump scares. I'm not but... saying that, I'm not saying yeah, that. Yeah, no, no, no. What no. I'm saying is, is that it's, it's psychological. It's more played on your mind you follow one particular character who's going through a mental breakdown because she can't determine whether or not she's sane or whether or not what the hell is happening to her is real mm. like and well that is psychological and that in that itself that. is like a I lot don't think it's so with. much about her like questioning if she if her she's strong sanity. in her mindset yeah it's other people yeah. refusing to accept it and like i think it's thing is it's really to me it's a really clever script yeah some of it's on the nose of the dialogue mm. but what it does with all those little points it's like the opening that she's we discussed it, um, on the way back um we like yeah like the openings where it just happens she's ready to escape we're not seeing her as a victim we're seeing we haven't her seen her anything strength. before that we haven't yeah. seen his no but Would like you, but that's it think, which I we, think that... you can get the feel of what kind of guy he is by how drastic she is to leave him yeah, I think that's the uh, that that that's the thing to me. You you never for a moment, and this is like a trope within horror films, is that the female character has to be turned into a victim first before like, and she is through like well, after he becomes the Invisible Man, but when, before when she runs away, you don't see any of the the abuse. It's only from her. Uh, so, and so she's so not she, portrayed as a victim. Exactly, she's portrayed as a survivor yeah. to start with, and so you don't get. And it's her surviving that after exactly. that. And then building upon that, like by the end of the film, she's pretty much um, the heroine. Mm. The heroine? <laughs> she's pretty much the hero. Like, because she's like actively going after him mm. or the invisible man <laughs> to try and just 
you know, get rid of all of her demons that he created. Mm. And the thing is, Elizabeth Moss, like, she's always a good actress. Yeah. Um, if anyone's ever seen Mad Men, she was amazing as Peggy. And that was, like, kind of a starting point. She's in Us. Yeah, that's the, yeah. she's in Us. And We've she's, brought that up many times, so we may as well mention it again. She's in a hell of a lot of good films and always knows how to bring this kind of weird normality to strong women. Mm. I think she was a good choice for the film. I mean, she's a Scientologist, but... That, I think, I think j just to touch on that, so uh, obviously I tend to study more about characteristics and um, people's performances and whatnot. Um, with Elizabeth Moss, um, Elizabeth Moss, she is very much a kind of character up until this point, um, or a, a, an actress up until this point, where she, she's been in films, but she's never been the focal point. Yeah, and she's in this a case, she's yeah. yeah, she's a great character actors, actress. Um, but this is the first film I've properly seen her in where she's the focal point. And yeah. oh my goodness, did she just steal the show? Like them bits where she's breaking down and just her facial expressions and everything, and the way that she kind of reacts to different things. It's like oh my good. This is like, the thing. The film does really well of of making the Invisible Man's like a terrifying idea of just that constant torment from a psychological level and then on a physical level and then on a really violent level which I don't want to like we do spoilers but I don't want to reveal any of the spoilers of the violence in the film not the end well not, not just the end I mean like well, well that would be the scene but you know, the <laughs> violence in particular is yeah. done so well and so shocking it's really surprising but by having like that because the thing is with the Invisible Man is he's always been an egomaniac sort of character yeah and we were saying like in a weird way he felt like Iron Man, in the sense that instead of telling the story about the cool dickhead guy who's like saving the world but still a dickhead because he's an egomaniac, why not tell about the people around him? And that's a really great take on the Invisible Man. So it doesn't matter later on when you do meet the Invisible Man and so you're like, okay, we don't get much of him. You, you know what kind of thing you're getting. And it's, it's nice to see that take on reminding people that billionaires can be dicks. Instead of yeah. idolizing them with people like Iron Man and stuff like that, where it's yeah. like, hey, they're cool, they're cool, they're saving they'll make the world. A, they'll make a suit and save the world. No, yeah. they'll make a suit and stalk their ex girlfriend yeah. and, and try and torture her. And that's the thing. It, to me, that becomes quite believable because he's sure he's a genius. Don't ever he's break up with money. him, man. <laughs> but most, most, most geniuses basically, you know, there is always that element that they become fixated. In most like sort of stories, and it's usually a love related thing because they usually don't have the emotional skills with love, and you don't you obviously not gonna see that in Iron Man. It's usually gonna be one girl for in each movie. That's because it's a superhero film. Yeah, and that's the and thing. It's set with, up like that. With this film, the, the, they kind of establish that with just all of his actions and stuff. And you, I've I've seen it discussed on Twitter and stuff, but you never really know how the suit works. You no. just well, see the suit, and that's brilliant. And yeah, that's yeah, great. but you, you, don't you get... kind of you can work it out. Me and Jack spoke about this, so you can work it out because of all the cameras. So they yeah, they already they have invented this kind of technology. But I mean, it didn't have that, yeah. to like suffocate. But you they, they, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. You, you, you they kind of showed you in one shot where they kind of showed the cameras coming up, mm. like within the suit when she like does her thing within the house. I'm trying to do it spoiler free. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, she basically does that and you can kind of see the cameras and that's what then kind of makes you realise that, oh, it's reflective. Yeah, well, no, reflect that's true. It's recording imagery around. It's just, to then it's nice that sometimes, because so, films a lot of days have to try and give you a realism aspect when it comes to any sci-fi element where it has to be over Well, spoon-fed. Yeah. It's either spoon-fed or it's Nolan-fed where, where it kind of works but it is still spoon-feeding you. Yeah. But like what the film does do well though is uh, it, it sort of comments on um, film itself and and the the idea the very idea that like notion within you know if I say to you oh what's the typical thing that blokes say if you if you said what would you do if you were invisible it's right. always it's always a joke about going to the girls' changing room. It's always yeah, it's always yeah, something yeah, yeah. like that. Oh, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> well, you're not, that's, no, I'm... that's surprising to me. Most most people like yeah, that's like, the joke. Uh, that's always like yeah. That's always the. It's, uh... I, I'd probably drive my car and freak <laughs> the shit out of people. It's just like self-driving car. But 
Uh, besides been. that, you know, <laughs> playing on that sort of uh, that idea, they, they they looked at sort of male gaze theory quite often. The, the idea that he was always there in the room, just watching her, and and she was sort of aware of it. That that sort of idea that you know women walking down the street will get looked at a lot more by blokes walking past and things like that. It, it plays into so much of that, it's and it, it like it was re- like really really ripe with sort of metaphor and. And um, analysis of, of uh, previous films and things like that. And, and, yeah. I like that. I think you're 100% right. Yeah. I personally That's a really it. great film. And uh, I think it's cool to see that universe, uh, Universal will go in that sort of direction instead of trying to get the teenagers... I mean, you still get teenagers with horror, but at least they're actually trying to make... Well, when we're in the cinema... make a decent film as well. Yeah. When we're in the cinema, it was full of teenagers. Yeah, was, they wouldn't shut up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very reactionary. <laughs> and, like, constantly getting up and moving. Like, just, just sh- sit down and shut up. Bladder control, like, god damn it. person. Um, still, it's, it's worth seeing it in the cinema. It is a good cinema yeah, experience. I imagine course. it would be a great experience at home as well from, like, streaming it. Yeah. Because especially if you, but, but don't go on a Friday. Go on, a, go on a weekday yeah. when they're at school. Yeah. Like you know. <laughs> so gonna wrap that up, um. So yeah, if you if you liked our review on the Invisible Man, you liked our <clears throat> sort of synopsis of the films coming up in March. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, and most importantly, give us a subscribe. <laughs> and um, yeah, if you feel like you've got a review of uh, a film you want us to do then leave a comment other than that thank you guys um really appreciate it and uh yeah trash arts take out bye bye